Now, it's, been a, it's been a while to be back, so it feels good. It feels a little bit like being back home. So um, thank you for inviting me to give a talk. And I'd really like to talk today about a project that a group of us have been working on that's been rather, actually, a lot of fun and a lot of excite and rather exciting. And it's actually in the title of Face Fresnel Lens Development for X-ray and Gamma Ray Astronomy. So the goal of this whole project, really, from the aspect of this is going to be the talk, is going to be the development of Face Fresnel lenses, which I'll describe in the talk, and demonstrate their imaging capability and show that how their application could be in a, a say in an astrophysics mission. And so there's a lot of elements that are involved in the research. So here is, it shows a shows a Fresnel lens made by a MEMS fabrication technique. So we have some optical testing to show the uh, response of a X-ray CCD camera to a lens imaging a spot from a source. And then when we put it together, because of these things have long focal lengths, we're going to be talking about developing formation flying missions such that we could put a lens on one craft and a detector on the other and make an actual virtual telescope. So here's a list of the collaboration. And a lot of this work is really is going to a lot of papers that have been by, done by Jerry Skinner, who I had a pleasure to work with at Goddard, who's now moved, over, moved out to uh, Max Planck. Uh, so a quick outline for my talk is just a, a quick motivation of why X-ray and gamma-ray astronomy is, inter is interesting, uh, limitations on the current X-ray uh, and gamma-ray imaging techniques, giving an introduction to diffractive optics, and then really go into the, the really core of my talk is a characterization of these optics that we've done and show you some potential missions architects. And since every technology has to have a killer app, I'm going to hopefully have time to talk about the killer app for these things in astrophysics setting, and then some conclusions. So my motivation for basics for, for all of astrophysics is given by this poster that was set out by Goddard years ago, which basically shows the view of the universe as a function of wavelengths, if you will, from the radio all the way to gamma rays. In a, and so what you can see is that certain objects, for example, that certain objects like, for example, for here, the crab, depending upon the wavelengths, may come and disappear. And other objects, this is the Vela cluster here that comes and goes, and other objects may only appear at certain wavelengths, such, for example, this is a, this is a gamingo over here, which is only really observable and actually was, I believe, first detected in gamma rays. So in all of this, naturally, in any telescope, angular resolution is important. Just to highlight the importance, as a, again, a picture is worth a thousand words. These two pictures show what the, what the impact is of an order of magnitude of improvement in angular resolution from about 10 arc seconds to about one arc seconds from, that you could do by viewing the crab, a nebula, and the pulsar. Right? So naturally, you see that you could see finer features of the astrophysics object. And a more, a better, a uh, little bit more on a more global scale, this picture here shows that this is a log of the characteristic size of uh, astrophysical objects versus, as opposed, uh, versus distance for various objects. So it's kind of like in ultra energy composite rays, it's kind of like a Hillis plot. And what's shown here is that the objects kind of span various portions of this plot. And these lines actually show here what, what you can see. So, these are lines in angular resolution, and you can see objects above them. This line here shows what you could do if I could make a milliarc second, uh, milliarc second uh, telescope. And this one, that line down here, shows what you could do if I could make a telescope that has a fraction of a microarc second uh, angular resolution. And then I just took this point here, just leaving it as a blob. So this is actually looking at the AGN cores. And this blows up here. This is from a paper. So what's plotted here is various. Uh, Supermassive black holes of the function of black hole mass as a function of the distance is equivalent z, and with these, uh, so for some local objects, if we make uh, some assumptions on sensitivity and an experiment's uh, detection capability, what we could detect and say in, in a significant detection in one day, <coughs> and the line of interest is here is on these are these curves here, which shows this is a if the Schwarzschild's radius is equivalent to one microarc second, so we could resolve objects above that. And this one's if you could do a factor of 100 better. So the point being is that if you can improve angular resolution, you can actually do some of these things and actually be able to image the event horizon around distant uh, massive black holes. So, so on, a, even on a more global scale, this slide here gives kind of uh, as a function of sort of the uh, log of the uh, angular resolution as a function of energy for various techniques from going from the radio through the uh, optical and then into the x-ray. And so that you could see that one can talk about, and actually one does in radio, talk about, you know, milliarc second or maybe even a little bit better uh, imaging. 
but that at higher energies it's actually more difficult it's actually more difficult to image the photons and therefore one doesn't achieve the uh, achieve high angular resolution what I'm going to be talking about today is the potential for optics to actually perform milli arc second imaging this is going to be a mission mass and I'm going to talk about in an energy band around 10 keV what's more interesting is that the potential of this technique spans a lot of energy range but also can push you down to the sub micro arc second range now I want you to compare this here to this here this is nine orders of magnitude improvement when do you ever get a chance to work on something that you might be able to improve something by a factor of a billion okay this is why I really this is why I get excited about this so x-ray and optics and imaging so x-rays are very difficult to a very difficult image because if you write the index of refraction in a complex form where it has one minus delta times a complex term where delta is infra, uh, the index decrement and k represents the absorption is that at x-ray energies you look and that this delta is incredibly, incredibly small so even thinking about refraction at this uh, refraction from a lens is, is so small it's not even worth to think about and they just put compared to what a normal uh, index of refraction for glasses for comparison and also too is that x-rays are absorbed at near normal incidence because of the kappa term right however you can get significant reflection off of objects at small angles and this actually drives the construction of how current x-ray telescopes are done they're done by nested foils that form actually mirrors that then go into grazing incidence focus x-ray onto a detector this is from the Chandra experiment that's achieved about a half an arc second angular resolution now if you added up the total areas in this mirror you end up getting something close to you know a good part of a million square centimeters but in this plot here which is hard to see in this term this is actually this curve here traces out the effective area as a function of energy and so if we look here at a function around in the band around four to six kilo electron volts we're only talking about two or three hundred square centimeters effective area so I have a mirror that has a huge mass but I'm only getting a couple hundred square centimeters collecting area at gamma rays it's actually more difficult to concentrate I'm going to start at a little bit higher energy if we go to higher energy we could use, uh, use Compton scan scattering to do Compton imaging or even higher energies we could do make a pair production telescope such as Fermi and even higher energies as a group here knows you can use the atmosphere to look at air showers um, and do uh, via being detecting of uh, the Trenkoff light through Trenkoff telescopes but at lower energies what one normally does is make something called a coated mask and this is actually shown here for the Swift experiment so you put a blocking pattern above a detector and so therefore as a function of angle this pattern is going to be in a different place of this detector you can deconvolve this and then you can get some directionality out however it's you don't get too much matter of fact for Swift for the bad it's of the order of a some small about a fraction of a degree now for now we're going to move into what the development of face for now lenses are and so face for now lenses are natural evolution of diffractive optics so there's something called a zone plate which has efficiency at 10 percent where you basically <coughs> alternately block alternately block the radiation come in and pre-describe pattern as a matter of fact you can think of these in a way as a variable pitch diffraction grading such that the diffraction is putting trying to put all the energy at a primary focus another device is instead of if we block the energy if we put enough material in there to get up a, a phase change of pi we can actually improve the efficiency by a factor of four but if we actually can make the profile close to that needed to change the phase at every point to put it in a primary focus we can cre create a device it is nearly 100% efficient and potentially works at the diffraction limit. So what's exciting about that is if you think of how the, this is the uh, Raleigh condition for, uh, dif uh, uh, for diffraction limited imaging, is that if I put in, pick an energy at 10 keV and take a diameter of one meter, I'm talking about a, a lens now that the unit of angular me me resolution is measured in micro arc seconds. Furthermore, the entire late area of the lens can be effective depending upon the energy you're working at therefore I can make very light optics I can scale these to large areas or to piece them together I can even make arrays of them and they can work in certain bands from a few keV all the way up to greater than um, one MeV however diffractive optics are very chromatic meaning that they're they're 
their uh, imaging potential only works over a very narrow energy band. And I'm going to talk about something about achromats and show you some results that can actually widen that. But one thing you can't get around is long focal lengths. And for example, I have Doug, you could pass this around if you want to look. This is a mechanical sample of the Fresnel lens I'm talking about. Those have an effective focal length of about 113 meters um, that are allowed you to test them on the ground and actually characterize them and prove, uh, prove kind of proof of principle. But also, if we make large lenses, the focal length is so large, we're going to have to have formation flying a satellite. Now, for, now these type of optics have been, a long, been around for a long time. Matter of fact, in the original idea of the zone plate is attributed to Red in 1875, but if you read Rob, uh, Robert Wood's book on optics, he actually inherited Lord Rayleigh's uh, um, notes from his lab, and Lord Rayleigh had actually written down a few years before that he was thinking about zone plates, but he didn't think that they were, you know, it was sufficient enough for publication, right? So the point being is I guess if you're a lord, you don't have to worry about publish or perish, right? <laughs> And then, and then in 1888, and actually in the Encyclopedia Britannica, he suggested this concept of the phase reverse zone plate. So instead of blocking, you put in material to change the phase. And Robert Rood, 10 years later, experimentally demonstrated that. And Miyamoto suggested the phase for now lens in 61. And really, these came in the, the idea of to use them for, at, say, high, at shorter wavelengths or higher energies, really was enabled by uh, advances in microfabrication. Um, to allow, to allow, to actually allow you to make the profile you need, especially for applications for uh, microscopy. But really, I think what happens is that there was advances in the U.S. novelty industry in the 60s that really kind of motivated everything. I'm sorry, one question. What's the top That's silicon. Those are made in silicon. Okay. okay. I have a question. Is sure. something more fun than just moving it that I can do with it? No, nah, that's about it, okay. unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you got an x-ray, you got a 600-meter x-ray beam line, you could actually right. test them. Uh, okay. It's, it's shiny. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I thought I'd bring something, right? You know. You always come to a party with a gift. Well, it's not Superman, a gift, but okay. Only Superman has x-ray vision, right? Well, actually, you can make these into x-ray specs. You just have, they have really long arms. Okay. <laughs> So what I want to go through the design parameters, and actually there's a basic equation that kind of drives everything. So if you think of the lens and define it, there's a minimum spacing out the outside of the lens called p-min. There's a certain amount of material you need to change the uh, phase by a factor of 2 pi. Lens is a certain radius, and there's a certain substrate, and you have a focal length. And you put it in that the actual focal length is a, relation, is a linear relationship between p-min, the diameter of the lens, and the energy you're working at. So the th th thickness profile can be written as a simple function. You just go and you get to reset at every 2 pi. The, uh, the zone, size of the zones are set by the, um, fo by the focal length and the energy you're working at. And the thickness of the material is set, and the thickness of material needed is set by the material, just the wave and the energy, the wavelength you're working at, and the index of refraction decrement. So for example, for silicon, you can write this out. You need 2.55 microns per keV of silicon to get a phase change of 2 pi. So, so how this goes as material, and again, this doesn't come out, but I'll talk you through it, is that 2 pi can be represented as a function, but better yet, here is what you're showing is a plot as a function of energy, as a function of thickness, and here is 10 microns. These are in, uh, decades of uh, thickness increase, shown for various materials. So what's up here is shown is nickel, silicon, and beryllium is right here that you can barely see, and gold is down here. So this shows you that, as a function of energy, how much thickness of material do you need. So in, in the KEV range, you're talking of order, order of tens of microns for materials like silicon, a lot less if you're working at, um, with something like gold. But what, more, what also is important is how much absorption you can tolerate, and that's dependent on material too. So this plot here shows the absorption loss in percent as a function of energy for, for that material to get a phase chase pi. So one, one is talking about lower energies, one it really needs to be working in something like with silicon, or even be able to work with beryllium. But for the first, it's, since silicon's rather easy to pro, uh, fabricate, we ended up take, using silicon for that. So you are going to tolerate some, you're going to tolerate some inefficiency by working down here. But actually, if you, for a real lens, you could even talk about making it in beryllium to try to recover some of that. Now, well, I'm going to talk about what I call stepping the for phase for now lens. When you make a lens like this, you may not get the exact profile, and actually you may make it by making steps. 
So the efficiency of the lens is related to this function and is as related to the step size, to the number of steps you have per zone. So this shows how the ridges go. This is four step. This is a reverse phase lens, or you can think of it as a binary PSL. So what is shown here is the location of the various foci as a function of step. So here's where you get, when I said with the binary, you get 40% and you get, uh, you get higher order real and virtual foci. But as P increases, you see that you're putting more energy into primary sh and shifting the orders to higher order and putting less energy. Matter of fact, if you take P to infinity, you end up getting that this thing goes to 100% and all, and all the uh, high order um, foci go to infinity. As a matter of fact, for even just a simple eight step, not ignoring any uh, absorption effects, we can get a 95% efficiency. Now we can take into account what the effects of absorption are by just integrating <coughs> over, the material, over the phase and the material going through. And you could go through some math and it's actually easier to represent it for what we're doing in terms of a sum. Because this, instead of doing an integral, if I could do measurements of my sample that I did in a profile, I'm able to estimate what the efficiency is. And so, for example, what's shown here for, for eight step working at eight kV in silicon, when you include absorption, you reduce your 95% efficiency to about 82%. Now, at Goddard, we have a facility, it's called the 600 meter X ray interferometry test bed. It's basically a 600 meter uh, X ray beam line and it's in area 200. So Roswell has area 51, we have area 200. Okay. And so the beam line is basically we have a source. Now this shows the beam, beam pipe going down to the optics building. A source building is located about 146 meters from a, cha from a large chamber in here where we could computer, have computer controlled tables to move in and out lenses. And that's followed by from that about 452.6 meters to a liquid crude CCD x-ray camera down here with 13 micron pixels. So if we take this condition, and so if you notice too here, because it's asymmetry, the effective focal length of this is 110.4 meters. So if I make, want to make a lens and put it here, I better make this with this focal length to get a primary focus here. So we can use the focal length equation, make an assumption of if we put in the p min of 12 microns, diameter about three millimeters, a little bit less, we'll get a focal length of 110.4 millimeters. And for silicon, it means for a two pi phase length, we would need a 20, 20 micron, uh, two pi thing of 20 microns. So the radial profile that's shown here is actually that. So that when I would make a lens, the profile would vary to a height of 20.4 more, 20.4 microns, and about with a p min at the outer edge of 12 microns. Now, since we're working when phases, we can do multiples. We don't have to do two pi. We can do four pi, six pi, et cetera. And for the first lens, we actually did that because it effectively allows you to double the p-min for fabrication purposes. It makes it easier to fabricate. At the expense of adding some material and just take a loss in, a, a loss in efficiency. So the fabrication was done by my colleague, my collaborator at the University of Maryland, doing something grayscale lithography. So what, so what is done is that a, 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 uh, vari a variable opaque pixel mask is created and projection lithography defocuses it down such that when it, ex it exposes that pattern and it's done in a way such that it doesn't, it's not such a high regular resolution that you resolve the pixels. So they blend together and you end up being able to put virtually any kind of three-dimensional uh, uh, structure into photoresist on the silicon. Then once you can then transfer that into silicon with deep reactive ion etching and the, the, the depth gets by the selectivity of the process, so you end up getting basically in silicon a creation of a three-dimensional structure. So this is actually used, so this cartoon kind of shows what the lens is. We make the lens on the top, and then on the back side, if you put in a, if you put a uh, oxide layer in it, it acts as an edge stop, and you're able to etch the back side out, and therefore minimize the material for absorption purposes. So what's shown here is a, pro is a mechanical prototype that was built, which on the bottom is from optical profilometry. So this is the height in microns versus the uh, the radial distance out, and so the, the curves are the ideal. The thing is, the, uh, the, red is uh, the red is what was measured, and you could see that you could fabricate a really nice profile in silicon and therefore have a lens. So what's shown for an actual lens, it was done in a step repeat process. We made various dye. This shows the various dye on top, again, the cartoon. And then this is just flipped over, showing the holes etched in the bottom. 
and this is a busy plot here with a lot of information, but the fact is, remember I said when I, break, when I, when I make the, uh, when I'm trying to calculate the efficiency including absorption, I could put it into a sum, and, the, and a form of that was used based upon, and then use the optical prof, prof, uh, profilometry measurements to actually get estimates of what, what the difference, oh, that was one thing I forgot to do is turn off my Skype. <laughs> That's my daughter. Um, God, I hope she doesn't call. Uh, <laughs> Um, anyway, so you can see is that you can get estimates of the various efficiencies of the lenses in the various dyes and show dyes number 10. Now to go back, so remember this is a 4 pi PFL. Here are the parameters. It has 32 full zones. Here's a picture of the actual lens with a zoom of the, with this inside is the actual zoom. This is an SCM. But we have one issue with that, and this is going to come up in this testing, is that the focal length is mismatched for what we have. It's actually about 113 meters. We needed about 110.4. And again, this just shows you going through what a 4 pi lens versus a, a 2 pi lens looks like. Right. So the fact of the matter is in this asymmetric, so going back to the focal length, the fact is that because we have a different focal length, the primary focus is actually going to be 43 meters downstream of the, uh, where the CCD is. And I'll talk about how we correct that later. Now, one thing you have to realize that with diffractive optics is that, oh, this is going to be hard to see again, I apologize for the level of this, is that the profile that you see is not going to be just a, if you will, a airy, an airy disk or an airy function just widened, right? Depending upon where you look, the diffraction is actually going to put actual shape into the profile that you measure. So, for example, let's say we have a lens where the primary focus here. This is a result of a simulation done by uh, Nicholas Gorius, who's a student working on the project. So you get the nice airy pattern here, right at the Z, at the primary focus. But if I move at different positions away and measure what the profile looks like, you can actually get an estimate of the size by doing simple, uh, treating it as a geometrical optics problem. But actually what you see in the profile, you can actually see structure of the diffra as it diffracted fields. Um, uh, diffractive fields actually uh, uh, form the image. And matter of fact, here what this is shown here is that you see that this is actually show, supposed to be showing you the intensity as a function of z on axis. So you see it's on axis. It's not that there's no energy put in here. Just you've reached certain points of here that on axis it's actually down to zero and the shapes are looking something like looking like this. Okay, so what, does an image, so what does an image look like? So this is kind of reproducing the first time we put it in. We had no idea what we we're going to see. You put the device in, you move it around, and you're seeing. So this is showing the CCD. There's 1024 by 1024. It's a megapixel X-ray camera. So these are X-ray events happening in. So we're moving it around, and you're seeing groups form and whatever, and you think you might see something to finally you saw something like this, right? So this is actually the lens actually imaging X-rays on, on the detector. And so we can use now, if we could get an estimate of how well we're doing in terms of angular resolution, it turns out there's a lot of serendipity that happened in this project. And one of them, the x-ray source that we had was supposed to have a nice circular um, spot. It didn't. It was elliptical. It was about 40 by 60. But you actually can use that to get an estimate. So this is one picture. This is a zoom. And this is showing the bare source. Uh, measurement here, and then we rotate it, and you could see it here. So uh, you could see that you're getting about 20 microns resolution over 150 meters. That says that you're, you're imaging at least at 28 milli arc seconds. So if we calculate what we should get from diffraction limited, it should be 13. Um, we have to take an account of the, uh, the uh, term that is due to the fact that we have a finite pixel size that adds a little bit. But more importantly, is the source is rather large, and that actually dominates that. And if you add these up, it actually agrees. So the initial indication of this is, is that the lenses are imaging fairly well. Another thing is, is if I want to probe this, I'm going to have to really constrain this by using either um, uh, by using uh, narrow slits or narrow pinholes. Now we estimated the so we estimated the efficiency of this PF. I actually measured the efficiency of this PML P, uh, P, PFL. Let me get a drink of water. Hold on. And basically, so you'd actually go through the line. We actually put a 25 micron pinhole to make the make the uh, source actually uh, circular, uh, circular. And then measuring at uh, the copper, at copper, it was a copper tube, so we're measuring at, at, at 8.04 keV. 
the CCD has enough resolution to allow us to do that. So then we look at the spot and we calculate how much energy is within the spot and using, say, for example, five sigma here. And then we also had a, if you will, just basically a hole the size of the lens that we went through and measured. And therefore, you can determine the efficiency. The theoretical efficiency for this, after you take an account of absorption of the PFL in the substrate, is about 47.6%. Note that for a binary PFL, if we made it, it would only be 26.9. It's different uh, um, from the 40 because we have a 30 micron substrate. And actually, we measured it to be 35.6 plus or minus to about 10%. So first of all is that you're able to get a higher efficiency than, than a uh, simple zone plate. But the other issue is that we, we have energy loss in this, right? And we're going to want to determine it. And so this is a measurement of a three millimeter diameter PFL that was on the disc. And this, we also had a 4.7. We actually measured made a little bit less uh, efficiency. This actually had a smaller P min and may just be indicative of that at those outer edges, the fabrication technique didn't, um, didn't reproduce the profile quite well. The plot here just shows the energy measurement. This is the uh, 8.04 8 keV. This is the K alpha photon from a copper, uh, copper target. And these are the 8.9 keV photons for the um, K beta. And so what's shown here is that if you could actually see this, this would be populated. This shows you what the roughly three millimeter calibration hole looks like in a detector. So you could just count events here, get the event rate, and then compare it to the event rate you get from imaging. Okay, so now, where did that extra energy go, right? I could comment it back that we're missing about 12% of the energy. And so what's shown here is to motivate you is to take a look. So these are actually now, these are from early. So we actually put in the beam, there's actually now a shutter that closes during the CCD readout. And that's why this artifact was here. These are overexposed, it's bare source, but they actually give us uh, guidance to what's going on. What's interesting is you actually can see here. So here's the spot. You actually see two rings in here. And the question is, why are these rings here and how much energy is in those rings? Now, we, for, so we know that we have some fabrication artifacts in the PFL. As a matter of fact, it's known in this technique of uh, 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 the, uh, this MEMS technique of grayscale lithography that it's just, it's harder to etch when you have narrow structures than wide. And you actually can see that. So these are showing the optical, optical profilometry of the profile towards the center on the outside of the ledge, uh, lens, excuse me. And you can see that you have a growth in a substrate here. As a matter of fact, this led the group, so while we're testing the lens, to actually, you can actually put in and compensate that out at the design stage when you're designing your mask, such that you allow it to basically etch slower at open structures or quicker at narrow structures. So therefore, when you etch, you end up getting a flat profile versus the profile getting here, and it's called, the, the Maryland group developed this thing they call it card for compensated aspect ratio dependent etching. We also have another artifact due to the fact that there was a, the backside got over etched. So instead of having a nice square structure, there's actually, the profile actually looks like this. So what the impact is on this plot, I'm gonna have to guide you through the curves, is that you can put, this, put these artifacts into the simulation. And so what's plotted here is the enclosed energy as a function of radius. So it's actually finding, if you will, the half, in a way it's like, could you determine on a lens the uh, half power diameter? So what you see is a quick rising of these curves going up and then flattening off. But the shapes of this is dependent upon the slope, this slope put in the simulation, right? And this artifact here with zero slope is here is from that here. And what's interesting if, now these are four pi lenses. If you had simulated this lens as a two pi lens, this effect wouldn't be here. And the fact of the reason is, so it's an interference effect due to these fabrication artifacts and the four pi or four pi nature of the lens. And so when you say that, well, I can, re you know, a four pi lens should be in a way equivalent to a two pi, it really isn't. Because if you think about it, you have this structure here, but then you're actually having another, if you will, another actual lens, if you will, that's kind of a block structure. This kind of has, you know, it has some type of phase change in it there. So, that, so the point being is that, that through simulations, you could see that the energy loss is due to inference induced by fabrication artifacts. So how does this compare to, actual, to the actual data? So what's shown here is actually the red curves are simulations. This is assumed that we have a slope that led to a 15 micron uh, thickening of the substrate at the largest radius. 
So these plots here are shown the enclosed counts as a function of radius. This one just goes out to 400. This goes out to the whole length. This is at 8 keV at the, at the copper K alpha. You could do the same for K beta. It's going to be wider because we know it's more defocused. But what you can see is that the curves and the data match fairly well. In a particular look at this. Remember I told you that when you're off, when you're when you're uh, measuring off focus in these things, you can pick up the you can pick up features in the diffractive uh, field of the profile you're measuring. You're actually picking these up in the measurement. Now, there's a slight difference here by that because the fact is, is that I, this was run at 50 microns, and if we ran it at 10, this will go down. I just didn't have that I, for that for uh, this talk. And this plot here just shows you for the larger lens when you put in 20 microns, they actually get met much better agreement stakes in my case. Okay, so how we're we doing. So going back here, so here's what it appears to be at 25 mic. This is what appears, this curve here corresponds to about 25 um, milli arc seconds angular resolution. So I could try to sit up here and wave my hands and saying, oh look, you know, that's really close to demonstrate these things are working near the diffraction limit. But really, what one wants to do is one wants to be able to change and actually measure at the primary focus. Now, I can't add 43 meters to my beam line, but I can change the focus of the lens by adding a refractive component that has enough power to bring the focus of the lens into foc to bring it to basically the correct focal length. So what we do is we choose the power of this lens that actually has a focal length about a kilometer. And it's energy dependent. For, uh, K, we designed it for K alpha. It's made in Xilex. We put it here so you could see that actually that really nice circular thing I had. Well, some accidents happened in this actually. The lens actually broke in four pieces. Luckily, not on the lenses I wanted to test. So this shows the, uh, the precise alignment technology used in uh, putting on this refractive component onto the lens. Actually, there is because the backside holes allow you a natural alignment feature. So if you put a little nipple on the back of this, it just fits in quite nicely. And so then what we could do is then we can actually correct the focal length at K-alpha. We have also corrected at uh, K-beta if we wanted to. I'm not going to present the results. But what is interesting is that the focal length of this in its nominal case is like 125 meters behind the lens. So this is what one gets out when you correct the focal length to what you should be. So this is actual PSF distribution. So this shows the width of the image in pixels. What this, the width, full width, half maximum corresponds to angular resolution of 20.5 milli arc seconds. This is the image we use a 5 micron slit to achieve this, and the theoretical efficiency is 15.9 milli arc seconds. Right? So now I can make a strong argument that this lens is actually imaging close to the diffraction limit. And the other point about this, this is, over, this is over one hour of beam time. These lenses work so well that you have to turn down the intensity of beam because to mitigate the effects of pile up in the CCD camera. Next, we tried to say we wanted to, in the second generation lens, we wanted to move up in higher energies and actually try to make some larger lenses. We tried to improve the fabrication process. So what's shown here is a, 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 a scanning electron mic microscope picture of a, a test structure that was going to be used for, a four pi, uh, for the four pi lens fabrication. And showing the profiles, now so this gives you the uh, scale of 10 microns, showing you how well, at least in the test structure, how well the pro they were able to achieve the profile. This is a sum of the actual looking into one of the disks. So the goal is actually, one, to make a lens that had the actual focal length. Two, make it at different energies. And also, two, is to put in this, contact, uh, this compensated uh, aspect ratio dependent etch um, process in to try to, try to remove the uh, fabrication, uh, to try to remove the loss of efficiency. So what I present here now is the actual, so this is actually the point spread function of the image at the without any correction. At 17.4, we get 14.2 milli arc seconds. That corresponds with a, that's the image of a five micron slit. That corresponds to roughly a theoretical position of 11 milli arc seconds. Again, saying that this lens actually images near diffraction limit. Now again, this was over, this was an overnight run. I was able to have about three hours of stable data operation. I needed no corrections to the data. One thing is that this PFL is not uh, imaging at its theoretical efficiency. It's only, it's only about a third. But, and this may be due to the fact that there's issues on the outer edge of the PFL where the, uh, where the profile is less than, uh, is not well matched to the ideal. But what's actually interesting about this is that at least a portion of the PFL is, is Im imaging near the diffraction limit. And the other part of it that isn't really isn't affecting it. And also, too, in that part that's imaging, we don't see any interference effects. So at least for that, 
portion of the lens that's imaging well, we think that the, one can make an argument that the, uh, the substrate ciscus is more uniform. Okay, so now hopefully you're convinced that you can make at least sample PFLs that work near the diffraction limit. The next part of this uh, research activity was trying to make something called contact pair arc mats or extended bandwidth PFLs. So the idea is kind of simple, that if you look at uh, the lambda dependence of, the ref of, uh, of refraction and diffraction, they're different in powers of lambda. And actually, if you put, a, say, if I put two lenses together and I choose the focal length of the refractive component to be f and the diffractive component to be half of that, then the, then the chromaticity, the lambda dependence, cancels out to first order. And therefore, you've made a technically a compound lens that should image, hopefully, at the diffraction limit over a much larger energy band pass. So this shows the optical analog. This shows what it is. You have a diffractive lens and a refractive lens. The idea is that for actually, if you make, start making larger lenses, you can actually cut back this and actually make a refractive Fresnel lens, like you think of a normal lighthouse Fresnel lens, versus paired up to a diffractive Fresnel lens. And what's shown here on this plot, so this is a plot of uh, basically intensity as a function. You could think of it as an energy response as a function of energy, assuming a lens designed for uh, a molybdenum at 17.4 keV. And so what the curves show is the inner curve here shows making some assumption on the, on the energy byte that defines an angular resolution and comparing that to what one could theoretically get in an achromat. So it looks like you can take something that had a narrow energy bandwidth and increase it to a larger energy bandwidth. So to, to explore this experimentally, we made what we say is a proof of principle achromat. So if you could see this curve, which you probably can't, this curve goes up. So this is a lens designed at 500 keV. It goes up here and then goes down. This is actually the efficiency. And this efficiency is defined at an ener these energies where I change the focal length to the appropriate place. The point being is that a Fresnel lens designed at, to be very efficient at one energy still is fairly efficient at, at another energy if you change the focal length appropriately. Right? So one can use this, and so this curve goes down here. And if you then change the amount of material, you get to shift this down. And so basically, I could take my 17.4 keV uh, design, and then this should work at close to half the focal length at 8 keV, close to half. Right? So that could form the part of the diffractive part of the achromat. So then we, we use a fabrication, but we just fabricate the height to what we need. Instead of the height was about 80 microns, we fabricate it to about 40 microns. And then we, have to, we design a parabolic refractor lens, not to have a full F, but actually to compensate for the slight offset from the uh, desired thing. And so experimentally, one can use a tungsten tube, x-ray tube, look at the uh, lines at 8.4, 9.7, and 11.3, as a multi as, as a source of multiple energy lines in a single measurement to see if we can get to see what the uh, response imaging response of the achromat is, and this is the result shown here. So this is with a five with a five micron slit. So this is the result. So this is pictures zoomed in pictures of what the slit size. So the slit's going in this direction, this way. What it looks like in the CCD, and then one can take that and fit the PSF and then get an effective, if you will, angular resolution. So at 8.4, we get about 40. At 9.7, we get about 60. And 11.3, we get 100. Now, what's interesting about it is the following. If I did not have an achromat, and say I just had a simple lens designed at 8.4 keV, this picture, the zoomed-in picture, would be completely filled. Okay? This wouldn't be here, it would be filled. Furthermore, at 11.3, the entire CCD would be filled with, with x-rays. So the fact is, is that we were able now to get fairly decent imaging over a much wider energy, much wider energy band pass. Now, ideally, this should be, as I showed you before, at the 8 keV lens, we were able to get about 20 milli arc second angular risk, a PSF corresponding to 20 milli arc second. So we're off a little bit, and this is something that we need to be investigated. We might be off. We might have a slight focal length mix match of the, uh, of the, uh, of the lens components. Oh, okay, I'm good on time. So, what would, so now, 
So now you should be convinced, like, great, okay, you can make these little lenses and they look like they work at a short focal, a relatively short focal length. What would an actual mission look like? So as an example, this is a mission it's called a mass mission. It was trying to make a milli arc second X-ray mission. It was put into the advanced uh, ast uh, astrophysical concepts call right before the last Decato survey. So the idea is we take five of these Fresnel lenses, make them a meter long, make them a meter in diameter. We put them on one spacecraft. The focal length is a thousand kilometers, so we have to formation fly spacecraft that to make this virtual telescope with a separation of a thousand kilometers. And then what this plot shown here is then is this is the effective area of this potential mission, showing for how the Fresnel lenses are chosen in, f in five different energy band passes to try to, to try to fill up an energy range between about five and about, about a little bit more than 10 keV. And I want to make this comparison here. This is what's done for Chandra. So you could see the gain, the tremendous gain in effective collecting area that you have. The other thing is if you calculate the mass of these lenses on this, and even for some support structure, you get about 20 kilograms. And that's compared to actually the mirror mass of 1,500 kilograms of for Chandra. So you could see that you can make lenses that actually focus with better effective area at a better than milli arc second angular resolution, almost a factor of 1,000 improvement over Chandra that are very light. Now I want to go into talk about formation flying. So can you actually put two spacecraft together and actually form a virtual telescope? So at, at NASA Goddard, there's something called the Integrated uh, Design Center. And also at JPL, there's something called Team X that does the same thing. So you either go to IDC or go to Team X. With concepts of mission, you have engineers that are there to work you, work with you to either design your instrument or design a mission around it. So in when we did this for the formation flying, we had a group from guidance, navigation, and control to try to sketch out, can you do formation flying? So let's assume that we have a thousand kilometer satellite separation and that we're in kind of an Earth's drift away orbit. So one satellite's actually in a real orbit around the sun. Another one is in a pseudo orbit that we have to correct a little bit to keep the formation we want to fly. If we, we calculate the space from these things, we can get what spacecraft we need. And it turns out to do that, if we do a five-year mission, you only need 130 kilograms of fuel. And why is that? Okay. For station keeping, to keep this formation, you only need thrusters that, that have a fraction of a millinewton thrust to keep the formation for this gravity and environment around the sun. And if I'm not too greedy about my repointing, so that is I'm going to be on target, I'm going to let my, let my, my sis, one uh, spacecraft repoint in a day's time, assuming 20 degrees between target, I only need something modest for the thrust potential. And there's a Technology called ion propulsion, where actually it's on the, it's actually, I believe it was at the New Horizon mission to go into Pluto. It's very efficient that it has incredibly high uh, specific impulses that allow you to get very efficient thrust and therefore don't need much fuel. Matter of fact, you do the rocket equation, you actually can calculate this. And this is just a, using, looking at the rocket equation. This delta V you need to set by the separation, you need, or the distance you need to go into time scale. And this is just set by the ISP, and you can see why you get the greatest. Uh, greatest gain. And this is the other thing you get out of when you go to the IDC, you get pretty pictures of things and fairings. Right. Now, so, one of the things we've been doing is trying to develop, trying to further develop the formation flying. So, so the propulsion looks feasible, but the whole spacecraft navigation, alignment, control needs to be developed. So you could think about and actually going through that, you could put laser beacons to allow for spacecraft alignment. So I can, with star cameras and that, I can align my spacecraft this way. But the trouble is figuring out where, how the hell to point it to an object I want to look at. Now, at least in the milli arc second, there, it looks like there offers to be a solution because there's an actual milli arc second camera called JMAX out of the Naval Observatory that one could use. But more so that a groups of us, both in helio, uh, helio physics and astrophysics, have been working with, the, with basically a formation flying group at Goddard 
to try to develop, at least at the first thing what we secured as internal funding, is to, to get analysis tools such that instead of us scratching down on a piece of paper, you know, what performance you need from various sensors such as accelerometers to do this, it actually it's a, it's a complete mathematical framework that you can analyze the formation flying problem. And this actually led to a proposal we submitted, this is a picture of this, called the Virtual Telescope Demonstrator Mission. This was to be show, this was two CubeSats, if you, uh, six U CubeSats, they'd be in low Earth orbit, they'd go in orbit, and every so often we put them in a formation and then measure and demonstrate that we could do it, and we wanted to do this at an arc second level. And the idea behind this is that you do it at a certain level, and then you first demonstrate it, and then if you want to improve performance, you could then, with these, the tools that we developed, see what, what development you need to do sensors to get the formation, to, get, to achieve the formation flying goals that you wanted to. Right. And actually, the thing is, the worst place you want to do formation flying is in low Earth, because gravity is so, it's so strong, you've got to compensate. But this is what was, this is what was available in the uh, Edison Small Sat call. So I want to go through is just briefly go through three mis simple missions. One is called the Helix Physics Solar Flare Imager. It would actually do uh, a tenth of a, a tenth of an arc second imaging of X-rays and solar flares. That there's a paper on. There's papers on these if anyone wants to look at that. Another one's talking about doing imaging in milli arc second, and then I'll talk about this this uh, extreme micro arc second imager. So if we look through, we say we only need a we only because the sun is bright. I only need a two centimeter diameter lens. I'm going to let the focal length to be 100 meters. I end up with an instrument with a field of view given about 206 arc seconds. And then with, with various assumptions on performance, I could achieve the, uh, the uh, angular resolution I need. But note, so this is kind of what you need for formation flying control. And so I'm taking that you need, a te you need a control of a tenth of your focal plane. So you need a centimeter control. But you need knowledge to the level of about a, a pixel that you have in your camera. And this, for this mission, you have to choose the pixel to be about 25 microns in order to achieve the angular resolution. Now, if I go to the mission, I'm going to separate these things by a million kilometers. I have a 5-meter lens working at 500 keV. I can achieve a fraction of a micro arc second. But look at the field of view. I only have an instrument that has a field of view of about uh, 2 milli arc seconds. Now, if I go to what's just, you know, so it's Goldilocks, you know, too hot, too cold, just right. Um, so if we look at a milli-arc second image, we actually might be a little bit more achievable. We're talking about actually making kind of a long mass, and we're talking about using meter-sized lenses and achieving micro, or excuse me, milli-arc second angular resolution. You see that we don't, the, the control for formation flying isn't that strict, that we only need knowledge at least at the level of a millimeter, and we need position control at least at 10 centimeters. So the point I want you to take away is that the idea that, look, shorter focal length missions are easier because in the extent they're not because you have to have better control. And these really obscene long ones are in, not feasible because there are the actual, you can actually do the propulsion for this in a reasonable amount of fuel if you repoint in a sufficiently long time. And for this mission, sufficiently long time is measured in weeks. Now I'm to the killer app. I've got two more slides. Okay, I call it shaving space-time phone with X-rays. And the motivation about this, according to this been paper's idea, is that there, the inherent quantum, fluctu quantum fluctuation, fluctuations due to quantum gravity in space-time actually cause an angular dispersion on electromagnetic radiation emitting from uh, cosmological distances. And so what happens, it's mild dependent, but basically you end up getting an angular spread that's dependent upon the distance and also the wavelength you're working at. And, and different models have different power, uh, power parameters. So what's shown here is what, if you assume for different models, this one's based upon uh, two-thirds. This is based upon the holographic principle. There's some other models. And some of these models have actually been ruled out by um, Hubble measurements. The actual one, the holographic one, really hasn't. There's been some going back and forth in the literature on that. So, and so the question is, is what could we, you know, so, What's limiting these is actually, if you think about it, is that if I go, because of this effectively is going one over lambda regardless of uh, the power of alpha, is that if I get, I get more gain for going to shorter wavelengths than trying to compensate by going to, going to higher z or higher distances. And so naturally you can't see my great curves, which I'll talk through them. So what's shown here is actually, so as a function of redshift z, 
and the function, and this is showing the actual size of this angular dispersion. This curve is like 10 keV, this is something like 5 keV, and there's actually various lines of various close air GN that are supposed to be here. You can see it on my computer. The point being is that if I had an emission at even 10 milli arc seconds angular resolution at an energy of, a, you know, say 10 keV, I'd be able to see this. I'd be able to see this from local AGN. Look, this is a Z of 0.2. Right? and actually see if this model works, even probe other models. The other important part of this thing is, if this effect exists, this idea of that I could try to image you know, black holes, at, you know, try to do micro arc second imaging of distance black holes, isn't going to work because it's all going to be blurred out by this effect. So it's quite, quite intriguing. Sorry, oh. on that last slide? Sure. Uh, is that y-axis, is that really this is, this is in milli arc seconds. Right, right. So, this, so I'm talking about doing imaging at 10 milli arc seconds. I have an image. But these curves look like the first major tick mark is at one arc second, right? This is this is this is. A thousand milli arc seconds per arc second. Yeah. Two, three, four. But if my imager is working down here. So we're, the models predicting. The models are predicting these curves as a function of energy. This is. Uh, 5 keV, 10 keV, and 15 keV. But isn't that comparable to what X-ray telescopes, I'm, I'm confused, isn't that comparable to X-ray telescopes can do now? Actually, there's debate about the one that, only one that probably can do it is Chandra. Mm -hmm. And there's debate whether or not can do it. The people that write these articles actually stated that, well, because of the grazing incidence optics, the PSF is so complicated you can't figure it out. Jerry and I went down and looked at the performance of Chandra, and we thought we could do it. And we actually put a proposal into the last guest cycle to try to look at some of the objects. You need to look at Z. At, you need to look at Z is a greater than two for Chandra. Right, right, right. And, right. and actually, we looked and put a proposal in. But in archive proposals, you know, it's like they want you to do all the work before they give you the money, and they only chose one archive supposedly out of each thing, so we didn't get funded this time around. But you're absolutely right. I mean, before I do this mission, I sure as hell want to look at the current data set to see if I could see anything. Okay. So I hope I convinced you that um, you could demonstrate that actually phase for now lenses can actually image near the diffraction limit. And that control of fabrication of artifacts secure to realizing theoretical, the theoretical efficiency are actually an interesting playground in, in terms of how, how, they operate, how the optics operate. Um, the proof of principle increment demonstrates that you can increase the band, gap, uh, band paths of these lenses to do decent imaging. And emission studies indicate that there's feasibility for formation flying of these eventual ones. So really in the future is what work is to be done is to continue to work on the acronymic development to see actually how, see how actually how far one can push it. And really the key one is we're working on is development of the formation flying technology. Because at least in, in NASA's strategic plan, this actually covers more than astrophysics. It covers exoplanets. If you look at New World's Horizons, what the occulter they want to fly, it goes with heliosphere, heliosphere, heliophysics in regard to solar flare stuff, et cetera. So I thank you so much, and I hope it was an illuminating talk.